I'm really pleased to welcome all of you here today. I'm Denise Mousewell, professor in the STEP program in Civil Environmental Engineering. I'm delighted to welcome uh, Abe Silverman, who's Vice President and Deputy General Counsel for Regulatory Affairs at NRG Energy, where he's worked for the past 10 years. His specialties include energy regulatory law, commercial litigation, power purchase agreements, energy market design, generator interconnections, and regulatory compliance. He was previously a staff attorney for the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and has a law degree from George Washington University and a BS in Geology and Earth Sciences from the University of Maryland. Having heard Abe speak in various venues around Princeton over the past couple of years, I've been impressed by his insights into energy markets. He's a rigorous grounding in technology and in economics, a creative approach to where energy markets are going in the future, a willingness to challenge conventional thinking, and an insightful ability to translate his analysis into policy recommendations. And also he has this amazing willingness to talk to students. So if you have interest in seeing him and asking him questions, he's really fantastic at interacting with everyone here and providing his insights um, for everything ranging from senior theses to PhD dissertations and beyond. So thank you so much for coming. I'm really pleased to have you, and I'm delighted that the PowerPoint's working. Well, so you notice in that, in that long list of accomplishments, you did not hear anything about computer savvy whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, so actually, this was, a, this was a metaphor for the complexities of the electric grid. Uh, because, you know, every piece has to work together at all times in order to have a reliable uh, system like we enjoy today. So it's a perfect example of what could go wrong if you, do things, uh, if you don't do things right. So faster, better, cheaper. Anybody remember that from the old NASA slogan before they sort of had a number of spectacular failures? But that's exactly what we want if we're going to decarbonize our economy. We need to do it faster, we need to do it better, and we need to do it cheaper. And so today's, uh, today's talk is going to really be about sort of putting out a thesis that the way to do this is through a competitive market uh, and that we as a society really need to step up and build the energy markets of the future. And frankly, that's where each and every one of you comes in. Uh, how do we build a better, a faster, better, cheaper way of, uh, of delivering power that is green power? And can we do that in a, in a, in a cost-effective way? So let me just go start with a little bit of, of, of background here. So this is our global carbon, excuse me, United States carbon emissions. The, the pink is all other sectors. The yellow is transportation. The blue is electric generation, obviously coming up through 2014. Probably need to update that at some point. This is the really important side, though. This is where we need to be in 2050 to meet our science-based carbon targets. This is the Paris Protocols. Uh, and I think everybody agrees we need to keep below that two degree warming scenario. And you can see 2050 emissions are way, way below where they are today. It's an 80% decrease. That's the 2050 economy wide carbon emissions profile that matches what we're talking about with Paris. And as you can tell, the blue sector, the energy sector, has to be below way below uh, uh, that 2050 number because it can only make up about a third of our 2050 emissions. And of course, at the same time, we're electrifying the transportation sector. So a lot of that yellow line needs to be accommodated under the blue wedge as well. So I'm going to zoom in uh, much closer onto this next section here. So again, we have our 2050 economy-wide target is the black line, ignoring the other sectors for a moment because I'm not smart enough to deal with all of them. I just deal with the energy. This is the carbon profile if we replace coal with natural gas and meet future demand with natural gas. Now, is that above or below our 2050 target? <laughs> Not just a little bit, right? It's massively above. We will blow through our 2050 carbon, carbon targets in the energy sector if all we do is coal to gas switching. So let's look at the next line. This is what happens if we replace all the coal with very efficient combined cycles and use renewables to meet any future load growth. Still, we're not even close. We're not even close to that 2050 target. So what do we need to do? It's really you need to be on that red trajectory. Probably should make that green and the other one's red, but uh, we need to be on the red trajectory and that is renewables replacing coal and using renewables to meet all of our future load growth needs, what I often refer to as coal to clean. And that, the, the, the really interesting step 
is how do we get from that coal to clean, particularly when the markets are telling us we should be investing in combined cycle natural gas today. And if you think about it, a natural gas plant built today really will probably come around sometime, come online sometime in 2020, and we'll be continuing to operate for the next 30 years. So we have this really interesting problem where the market, today's markets, I, I, I think it's safe to say they're somewhat antiquated markets, are sending one investment price signal, and yet our carbon reality dictates that we head somewhere else. So really, you know, again, and I'll, and I'll sort of end with this, the great challenge to all of you is to figure out how do we get there. And I'm gonna talk about a couple of the main uh, policy options. So I'm not gonna dwell on this. Clean power plan, a lot of people were very concerned with the administration's repeal of the clean power plan. And my answer is, it's almost irrelevant. Because we're gonna meet the 2030 targets specified in the clean power plan, just through coal to gas switching, just by market mechanisms, with very little regulatory uh, intervention on the environmental side. And so, you know, if in four years, or what, two and a half now, I should, I should know the exact number of days, we've replaced the Trump administration with an administration more interested in clean power, they can put in a new clean power plan uh, that I think would, everybody would agree would be far more impressive and far more aggressive than the one that was, is now in the process of being repealed. So that's my don't despair slide. <laughs> so, you know, I, I tried to think, approach these things like a, like a millennial would. So I went and asked Yelp, uh, what's the best carbon reduction strategy out there? And here, 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 are, the, here are four of the, the top answers. One is to put a carbon price or a carbon tax into the economy. Economists love it. They will tell you that a carbon price is the most efficient way to price carbon, the most efficient way to reduce carbon, and all we need is a carbon tax and life will be good and we will successfully decarbonize our economy. As a practitioner, and that's very much what I am, I look at that and say there's a lot of flaws in it. But we'll talk about those in a little bit. The second option, which we really sort of, what I refer to as the throw bags of money at the problem strategy, is to have states, and it really is a state-by-state -state process at this point, enter into long-term power purchase agreements, or PPAs. Sorry if I lapse into jargon, please call me on it. I will do my best to, uh, to make it clear is to enter into long-term power purchase agreements for specific power plants of the renewable kind. Politicians love it. They love to be able to go to their constituents and say, hey, that wind farm or that uh, solar farm over there, I, I built that for you. I got that built, I got that financed. The banks love it because it's guaranteed money over the entire length of the contract. And the ratepayers, that is the consumers, that's all of us, end up, I, in my, you know, certainly I think the data show, paying a very high price for the carbon that gets reduced. So we're gonna talk about that in a little more detail as well. Third is, is, and this is very relevant to what's going on in New Jersey today, is what do we do with nuclear power plants that cannot, can no longer compete in the wholesale market? They are now going around looking for bailouts, and that's, let's call them what they are. These are for-profit corporations, who have been operating these power plants and making a lot of money for a long time. Now, the shale gas revolution, everyone familiar with that, has largely driven prices way down in the electric sector. The cost of operating a nuclear plant have risen post Fukushima. And so we now have this mismatch between what the markets are saying and the desire to keep these plants open. New Jersey has legislation that's currently pending in the state legislature to give bailouts to PSEG, the largest operator of nuclear in New Jersey. It's already happened in New York and Illinois, so we'll talk a little bit about why I think that's probably a bad public policy choice. Uh, I could also talk to you separately about why I think it's illegal, but that's a whole different, uh, that's a very different audience. The fourth, and this is the one that I love, right? This is what really keeps me up at night and makes me excited during the day, is uh, what do we do for the future? How do we redesign these markets in a way that actually integrates the renewable goals, so we decarbonize and use competitive markets to bring down the cost and get it done as quickly as we possibly can. My wife's in the audience, she's an astronomer, a professor of astronomy here. You know, there really is right now a clash between the federal government's energy policy and state energy policies. And very much like this picture, they're ripping each other apart. 
because it turns out both of them work extremely badly when they're sort of combined without any sort of thought and planning. And that's exactly what we have right now, completely unsustainable. Um, state renewables policy is a Jackson Pollock. The wholesale markets are a Vermeer. I actually, actually sort of find the mess a little bit compelling, so maybe I need different <laughs> pictures. But this is what we have right now. I mean, people are you know, operating on completely different regimes, completely different market goals, completely different objectives, and we need to unify them. I often make the joke, um, I often feel like a marriage counselor trying to get the federal government and the state governments to sit down and think of the children and work together and develop a cohesive strategy going forward. So, you know, it, it's not necessarily intuitive, I, su I suspect a lot of people in this audience, why we went to competitive markets to begin with. What's the value proposition associated with competitive markets? Why don't we just throw them all overboard uh, and control and command our way to a decarbonized economy? That is an option. That is what California is doing. That is why they have 30 cent power. It is a viable option. I don't want to discount it, but it's also a very expensive option. And I'm certainly of the opinion that we are better off if we bring some of the benefits of competitive markets and reduce the cost of decarbonizing rather than simply throwing money at the problem and hoping that, that rate payers don't revolt. So historically, you know, really since Sam Insel, uh, utilities were cost of service entities. They spent a dollar, they got a dollar ten back. And that's a very effective system for building infrastructure, but it's a very expensive. Rate payers pay too much. And innovation is really, really low under that system because they have no incentive to innovate. And I think you're seeing that right now with PSEG's attempt to get the, uh, the nuclear bailouts passed. They're sort of really clutching and holding on to yesterday's technology and not looking at how else they could spend that money. Um, so, and this is, you know, perfect example. The state of Georgia right now is looking at a, nuclear, a new nuclear plant that's $16 billion over budget. And the only reason that project is moving forward is because Southern Company is completely convinced that the ratepayers will pay them not only every penny they've spent, but a profit in addition. So they have very little incentive to control costs. Now that may be changing. There's some really fun stuff going on both in South Carolina and Georgia right now about where state regulators are looking and seeing, do we really want to pay them a combined $25 billion for two nuclear plants, or have they so mismanaged it that they shouldn't recover their costs? But for the most part, that is what happens in non-restructured states. Whereas in a competitive market, those costs are, pay, are, are borne by shareholders, not consumers. And you know, we can talk <laughs> for a long time about why that is, um, and I'm happy to answer any questions afterwards, or really, and let me just reiterate the invitation, I'm happy to talk to people, that's the fun part of this job. If you have questions for me after this, or you want to challenge any of my assumptions, please bring it on, I love it. Uh, so the reason we move to competitive markets is because of these abuses and because we were seeing power and power planning, power, power grids that were very, very expensive. And so we moved to this competitive market to avoid that. We wanted to take the risk from the ratepayers and put it on to shareholders, bring private capital, all the things that we are going to need if we are going to go through this next investment super cycle and invest billions of dollars over the next couple decades decarbonizing, we should do it in a smart way uh, that puts the risks where they should be. The big problem with competitive markets thus far is this, is this one, right? We have been really crappy at, at, at incorporating environmental externalities into wholesale power markets. There's a lot of legal issues around why that is. There's a lot of policy issues. Some of it's red state versus blue state traditional politics, but there's more to it than that. Um, and even in areas like New England, where there is a consensus about climate change, where there is a consensus, largely blue state governors, we still haven't managed to do it, even though every, all the constituent pieces all sort of agree. So that, 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 that political issue is, is a really significant one, and I don't want to discount it. And my goal, you know, sort of, it, and, and sort of what I'm hoping to get out of this talk, is the call to make that happen. Put those environmental externalities into the wholesale price in various ways we can do it. Oh, there you go, there's my thesis. Benefits of competitive markets, I'm going to skip over that just because they save everybody a lot of money annually. $3 billion, our electric bill is lowered. This is the PJM region every year, uh, with PJM as the mid-Atlantic states. 
I will happily provide these slides to folks. This is sort of you know, a little bit of a complicated uh, graph, but monopoly utilities typically are in this bottom right-hand box where innovation is lowest and costs are highest, and the risk to shareholders is the highest. Excuse me, risk to ratepayers is the highest. We want private capital deployed in these markets to keep prices low and bring as much, as much capital into the market as we can. So we want high innovation and competition in carbon, I think, is where we need to end up. So carbon pricing. This is absolutely critical. I feel like the debate has evolved in the last couple of years. What does carbon pricing do for us? We all love the idea. It's a relatively simple and fast to implement. But the question is, how effective is it actually? And the answer is a couple lessons you want to take. One is that carbon abatement through a carbon price is highly locational, locationally specific. This is actual data from ISO New England, where you look at the CO on the, on the y-axis as millions of tons of CO2 emitted. The x-axis is varying carbon prices, <coughs> ranging from a zero carbon price, where you get 33 million tons. That must be off by an order of magnitude. Anyway, you get 33. Uh, and then if you go, if you start increasing the carbon price by $10 a ton, you get to a lower number, but not wildly lower. And the total increase in cost to ratepayers associated with the carbon price as the price goes up, of course, is also higher. So you are paying a lot of money to add a carbon price to a system, but you're not really bringing, it's not high enough to bring renewables in. And there's very little coal to gas switching that can happen in New England because that grid is already fairly coal free. This is another way of looking at it. This is the amount of money it would take to bring renewables onto the system in terms of a carbon price. And if you're going to finance renewables through a carbon price, you need to have anywhere from $95 a ton down to $78 a ton type of carbon price. Most carbon prices we see today are very much lower than that. Reggie is, I think, $7 at the moment. It sort of ranges between 5 and 10. Um, the social cost of carbon midpoint associated with a 3% uh, discount rate is around $42. So in order to get the kind of carbon to make renewables attractive and to compete with a natural gas fire generator, you need to have a very significant carbon adder, and, and I think probably higher than is politically palatable. Now, of course, that's a political question, but at least at the moment, uh, it's a really significant one. <laughs> I mostly include this graph just because it's fun. Uh, this is an actual supply stack from ISO New England. Each of these little dots here is a generator, and you can see the way we, we set prices in the energy markets is you show the price of each generator is willing to bid at, then you draw a line where the load is and where they meet, you set the price. That's a very simplified example of how energy markets work. The blue dots are natural gas fired generators, and you can see they kind of come up like this, so that when we're at average load, price is around $27. As we get to extreme loads, it gets higher and higher. And then, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's off the stack. The yellow dots are what happens if we add a carbon price of $40 a ton. And you can see everything shifts up, which means that you're paying more for your power. But what you don't see is a large expansion of this area down here, which would indicate that we're seeing more renewables come into the system at $40 a ton. You don't see that. You do have a few. These red dots are the last coal in New England. And you take it from being dispatched any time that the grid is at 50% capacity or lower, or higher, excuse me, and you move it all the way out there. That's coal to gas switching. Carbon price is extremely effective for that. But that's not new investment in renewables. And if you remember back to our first slide, the whole thesis is we have to go coal to clean, not necessarily in scent natural gas. So apologize for the incredibly complicated slide there, but it just sort of amuses me. Yeah. It's more yellow the higher curve is blue and the lower curve. So isn't that a move to go to gas to clean? It's gas to gas. Sorry, it's a little bit complicated. The, the, the yellow, this, this piece over here. No, you go back around 10,000 megawatts. Yep. <coughs> yes, this is, this, is, this is the amount of new renewables you would get. 
right? It's this to this. Why does the code color change blue? Like that? I, 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 that is, I think that's just blue. Those are just blue dots with a lot of yellow around them. How much is, what's the with the yellow around them? That is with the carbon price. That's with a $40 oh, ton carbon yeah, price. Okay. All right, this is very helpful. This is the first time I've deployed this slide. Perhaps it needs a little work. I will, uh, but yeah, so that, I'm sorry, the two lines are one with the carbon price is the bottom one. Uh, the one at the bottom is that without the carbon price, the one on the top is with the carbon implemented. So the other piece of it, and I think this is a, uh, something that really deserves a lot more work. I've talked about this to some of you before, but is intraday variability in carbon intensity on the grid. So if you think about where prices are highest in today's grid, they tend to be where renewables are producing the least amount of power. Think about that for a second. Not always, but often. And so if we think about where the carbon price is the highest, where the carbon intensity is the highest and the carbon is adder is changing the price most, it tends to be in the hours where fossil fuel generators are on the margin and there's less renewables on the system. So where is the money that we're getting and paying in this carbon tax going? A lot of it is going to fossil fuel generators and proportionally less is going to renewables. This is definitely an area that needs more work based on real system data, but we've looked at this and we see this trend quite often. For those of you who are familiar with the California duck curve, uh, you know, think about it, right? The belly of the duck is in the middle of the day. A lot of times there's very little gas on the system, so the carbon adder is very, very low the renewables that are generating the most during that hour are making very little money from a carbon price. It's a real, it's, a, it's, it's definitely something worthy of thinking about. We often in my company say carbon pricing is good, but it's not a panacea. It moves us towards this, but it's not gonna get the coal to clean revolution that we need simply through carbon pricing. And I'll tell you, that's gotten me kicked out of meetings before, that thesis. I think a little less so today, but a lot of the environmental community is very averse to this message. I understand why they think it's code for not doing anything. That is not at all what I'm saying. I'm going to go through this really quick because, of course, I had uh, wasted 10 minutes of your time, for which I'm very sorry at the beginning. This is simply uh, a, a chart showing the price per ton of carbon abated for various state RPS and other programs. You know, and this is a real debate we have within the community. Is it bad? to have an RPS carve out expressly for solar? Or really of even more relevance to us today here in New Jersey, is it bad to have a similar thing for offshore wind, knowing that that price is gonna be way, way over here? Not necessarily, right? It is buying down the cost curve. It is driving investment into these sectors. So I don't know whether it's good or bad, but it's very relevant to look at the various costs of carbon abatement. And we have to ask ourselves the question, would we rather have non-sexy, you know, terrestrial wind or very, you know, normal solar panels that actually we can buy more of, or is it better to take our scarce dollars and invest it in sort of high-tech futuristic pro projects like offshore wind and batteries? I mean, this is a, you know, and of course the answer is some of, it, it's an all of the above kind of answer, but we need to decide how we're going to deploy that capital. And California assumes that the capital is infinite, so they just do it all. And that is a strategy, um, but I don't know how well it's going to work everywhere else. This is really interesting. You don't need to read, these, read the data here, but uh, wind plus storage and solar plus storage in XL service territory, which is in Colorado, a, you know, a great hub of wind and solar, came in between $21 to $36 a megawatt hour. Now, the average price on the system today is somewhere around $25 to $30 per megawatt hour. So here we're talking about brand new wind and solar with a storage component coming in at parity with grid power. Wow. Now that's Colorado, it can't be reproduced everywhere, and these numbers would be a lot higher other places, but this is exciting. This is the first really large scale solicitation we've ever seen with prices this low and having that storage component. Now there's some data we don't know, like we, we don't know how big the storage is, that's secret. So it could be a very small storage component to a very large farm, but still, very, very exciting. Nuclear bailouts, I mean this is one of the great policy issues of our day, right now. We're talking about seven and a half billion dollars over the next decade in New York. Uh, it's about uh, five billion dollars in Illinois that's already been committed to to keep a series of nuclear plants online. 
Here in New Jersey, we're being asked to pay $500 million a year for the next decade. $300 million? $300 million a year for the next decade. Uh, real money. And, and the question always comes up, is that a good investment? Is it good to keep these carbon-free generators operating, even if it means making this extra payment? And I look at it and I say, this is a really an area that's very rich for additional research. Because the question is, what's the opportunity cost of devoting that much shareholder, excuse me, ratepayer capital, consumer, all of our money, is this the best use of that money, or would it be better spent other places? I tell you, we just had a hearing on this last week in New Jersey, so saying that this is current is, is an understatement. Now, it won't surprise you as a you know, fossil fuel owning company that we oppose this, because we cannot compete with a generator who's giving away its power for free, which is effectively what they're doing. And it doesn't matter whether we're a renewable developer or a fossil fuel owning company, we cannot compete with free, they can't compete with free, and so when you give it away, you are telling people to take their investment dollars out of New Jersey. This is a little background. I'm, I'm just going to go through this quickly. It's an ongoing legal case. I am a lawyer. Don't hold it against me. But I'm happy to give you more details on, on the legal proceedings because they're very interesting. And I will note, March 12th, in New York City, there will be a, uh, an oral argument, uh, which should be absolutely fascinating. Far more interesting than this. Here's an example of... Um, of, of looking at the cost of nuclear compared to the cost of renewables, right? Here is the current price plus the rec value is the shaded numbers. So when you look at the amount of money that a renewable developer is making, it's the sum of those two. That's solar, that's wind in New York. This is PJM, that's PJM East. Because why is that number lower in the East? There's less wind. It's because the revenues are higher. So even though a wind farm in western PJM, which is like sort of, you know, that goes out to Chicago is the Midwest, is much cheaper to build. It makes a lot less in the market. So therefore, its total net revenues are lower. Here's numbers where we took the nuclear subsidy up at $16.50. We looked at the price that it would cost if you replace that nuclear generation with wind for Illinois. And you can see it's actually far cheaper to build new wind farms in Illinois than it is to pay to keep the nuclear units online. This is a legitimate debate, and probably the most important one we have right now, is do we absolutely need to keep these nuclear units online? Because that wind farm, it may be cheaper, but it will take years to build, and in the meantime, you are backfilling the nuclear plants with fossil fuel generation. This is the backsliding problem. A lot of environmentalists are committed to zero backsliding. And I look at that and I say that's probably an economically irrational thing to do. The counter argument is Germany right now, where Germany said it was going to move forward, retire all its nuclear plants, rely on coal more heavily for the next few years, but then it was going to charge ahead with renewables and get to a lower overall carbon emissions target. They are failing to do that. I still think it was the right thing to do. Maybe not shut down the nuke plants prematurely, but that, that was, yeah, was a political decision. So once you've done that, I still think that was the right economic choice. And in the long run, remember, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is a stock, not a flow problem. What do I mean by that? It's the total concentration of the atmosphere that matters, whether we have higher emissions for the next two years and then really dramatically reduce it after that. It's the, it's the stock that matters, not the rate. Now, again, this is a highly controversial position. But I look at our numbers, we come back to that first slide, and think about where do we need to be in 2050? And you assume that the nuclear plants probably have another 10 to 15 years of useful life in them before they're going to be retired anyway. So you are making the decision to rent the nuclear units for the next 10 to 15 years, rather than take that money and invest it in renewables, which will have a much longer uh, expected life. And we've done the math on this. Whoops. So this is out through 2047. This is using New York data. And we looked at the total amount of cumulative generation from the nuclear units is in gray, carbon free. And we said, OK, let's take that same amount of money and redeploy it into renewables. And 
you know, for the people who are concerned about the mid-2020s, yes, absolutely, there is a backsliding problem. Now, the other piece of this, which I won't get into too much, I guess I will a little bit, is that some of the nuclear owners are, are disingenuous about whether they will actually leave the market. You know, just like any other kind of car, right, all nuclear plants are not created equal. A car from the 1970s is going to be dirtier and more expensive to maintain than one they bought last year. And there's a lot of scale, economic scale in nuclear plants that makes a big difference. Whether it's a single or double unit reactor, whether they have one reactor or two reactors at a site makes a huge difference. A nuclear plant has anywhere between 12 and $20 million a year in security costs, right? <laughs> Most conventional power plants don't have that. So the larger number of megawatts you're amortizing that over, uh, the more efficient the plant is. Also, the age of the plant has a major uh, impact on how, uh, how efficient it is. So when I look at these numbers, I see large plants probably surviving under the current economic conditions, whereas the smaller, less efficient, older plants probably should retire. So when they come in and sort of a package deal and say, you have to pay all of our nuclear plants in order to keep any of them open, I'm very suspicious of that. But, you know, that's a debate with uh, me and Ralph. Here's the same thing for New Jersey. Uh, this assumes that offshore wind is going to be part of New Jersey's energy mix. Again, a very expensive source of carbon abatement, but there seems to be political will to do it. So I say bring it on. That's very exciting. Um, and so you sort of look at where the solar goes. Energy efficiency is critically important to all of these stories. And one of the really nice things about a carbon price that is a good advantage is you can take the proceeds from that and put it back into energy efficiency or other sort of demand side management issues. And you do get a lot of benefits. So you're almost getting a little bit of a double bang for the buck. This, as a lawyer, this is just absolutely fascinating. There is a real legal question <laughs> as to whether nuclear bailouts are legal. And the theory is that the federal government, that Congress assigned to the federal government the role of uh, running the energy grid in a lot of respects, and that nuclear plants, when a state comes in and bails them out, they're interfering with the price that the federal government, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has determined to be just and reasonable. And so therefore, where there's a conflict, state law has to give way to federal law. So that is the case. Now, people have tried to make this about also about other renewable energy credits. I actually don't think the court has to reach that issue, but it is now a live issue in these two parallel cases in New York and Illinois. Again, you can come and hear a lot more about it on Monday in New York City. Okay, so good, I've got a couple minutes left. This is really the, the fun part, right? What are we gonna do? What works better? How do we actually design a system that brings, you know, the, the, the universal American experience is that competition saves money, it encourages innovation, and brings down costs. I, I, I can't think of any sector in the industry where that's not true. Monopolies, certainly, have their place where there's a natural monopoly, but in things like generation of electricity, there is no natural monopoly. And so you look at telecom, once the monopolies were broken up, you know, 30 years later, we have cell phones. <laughs> Open question is whether that was a good change or not, but I think for the most part, most people think it was. And you know, is it directly related? No, but it allowed for innovation to come into that sector in a way that I think is, is, is really unrivaled. We could do the same thing on the energy side. But when we think about where we need to be to meet that 2050 picture, meet our 2050 carbon targets, this is what we see. Renewables as the new base load. Storage to balance out the renewables, absolutely key. Controllable demand. That's like you know, Internet of Things, uh, companies shutting down processes when power prices are high or conditions are scarce. Uh, that's controllable demand. And then when all those others are insufficient, we have fast ramping gas. California just had a record net load, record, record low net load, where they had to ramp 14,000 megawatts over three hours. Now, you know, I know some of, that, some of that's just gonna go over most people's heads, but it's a fascinating number to those of us in the industry. That's crazy, because what we had was we had the sun shining, we had the load picking up in the middle of the day, the net load goes way, way down, and then in the evening when the sun goes down, they have to turn on an incredible amount of generation very, very quickly. There's a bunch of things we could do about that on the demand side, right? We could encourage people not to use electricity at five o'clock. We can tilt the solar panels so that they produce power a little bit later in the evening. We can have batteries to manage that peak. 
but there has to be something. And at the end of the day, for the foreseeable future, I think there will be a fast ramping gas product. And remember, carbon emissions are based on the amount of generation you actually make. So if you have a less efficient gas plant that sits there 99% of the time and only runs for the couple hours where you need it, that's a good carbon story, even though it is a natural gas plant. So <laughs> this, these next two slides are the ones where I really need all of your help. Because this is a proposal, a uh, dynamic, forward, clean energy market by the Conservation Law Foundation, Brookfield Renewables, Next Era, and National Grid. We've been helping them with it as well. This is New England. My friend Robert Stoddard, an economist, has come up with this plan. And basically, the idea is to procure on a forward basis the renewables that we need to meet each state's clean energy target. Why would we do that? A forward market means you can give a contract today and they have three years to build it. The fact that it's a competitive market means that we're going to see the least cost. It's divorced from some of the parochial state concerns. I mean, I often say, why on earth would you build a wind farm, <laughs> leaving aside offshore, in New Jersey? Build it in Pennsylvania, build it in New York, and send it in. It's kind of silly that we want to build things here in New Jersey, right? Because if we actually care about carbon, then we would buy the least cost carbon abatement we can find. And if that happens to be in a neighboring state, so be it. Politicians don't like that answer very much. They want the jobs here in, here in our state. They say, why should we pay for other people's jobs? And I say, do you care about carbon or not? Uh, obviously, a compromise and one I typically lose. But this is, this is designed to get around that problem. This is designed to have a forward market. Renewables bid into it. They say, I can produce X megawatts of power for Y price per megawatt hour. And then they get rewarded or penalized based on the carbon intensity of the grid at the node on which they're located, the location they're located, during the delivery year. <laughs> That's a mouthful. But what we're really telling people is we want you, business people, to go out and locate your power plants, your renewable power plants, where you think the carbon intensity of the grid is going to be the highest and where you can displace the highest emitting generators. So for in New England, Maine is a huge renewable hotbed. Lots of wind in Maine, lots of large scale hydro coming in from Canada. Renewables are actually less valuable in Maine because you can't get them anywhere. There's transmission constraints on the system. So you can keep building more and more wind in Maine, but under this system, you would pay a penalty because you're displacing other renewables. The carbon intensity of the grid is very relatively low there. Whereas if you're in the Boston area, the carbon intensity is pretty high because we're mostly relying on old fossil generators. And so this would recognize that renewable plants are worth more in constrained areas where the carbon is highest and less in areas uh, where there's already a lot of renewables. To make this financeable, because I think this is the first time I've talked about financeability in this talk. It probably should have been the first thing. We are completely dependent on the banks. When we go and build a new renewable project, we have to get it financed or else it will not get built. And so the bank has to be assured that they're going to get their money back. And so they're looking for the long-term revenue stream. A power purchase agreement is the gold standard, but very expensive for consumers. So we're looking at a, at a different option here. We're looking at seven to 12 year contracts. That, that term still has to be determined in consultation with the banks and have this true up based on what the actual emissions on the grid are in the year in which they deliver. And the big question is, will the banks buy it? That's one question. And then the other question is, you know, will the state regulators buy in? Because you are asking state regulators to take a leap of faith and rely on markets that they do not trust that they are very concerned the Trump administration is going to undermine, uh, and you take away their ability to point at a particular project and go to ribbon cuttings. It's a pretty toxic cocktail if you're a state regulator. But I think, and this is sort of my thesis, and this is why I go around giving these talks, that we all work together can convince them that this is actually the right way to do it. And having a forward market structure that brings down the price, locates the carbon, uh, the renewables where they will reduce carbon the most, is better than targeted PPAs, uh, or vanity projects of various sorts. That's one option. This other one, I actually quite like. It's taking the existing market structure and carbon emitting resources have to pay back. 
they have to pay for the externalities in which they're, for which they're causing. And so you take the total revenue stream, you run a forward market, you say this accounts for all reliability and other metrics, so it allows better siting of generation, gives you a very nice locational price, uh, and then you charge them. And so a generator that has to pay a $10 fee, because it's the social cost of carbon or other number, times their expected generation of the delivery year, they have to pay that back up front. They add that to their initial bid, and it selects a different suite of resources. Yeah, sure, that's a very good point. Sorry. I, 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 <laughs> I live in a world where there's two very different mechanisms for pricing electricity. There's the capacity price, which is what I analogize to the lease payment on your car. For $300 a month, you get to have a car sitting in your driveway. You can use it any time you want. That's capacity. And then when you actually drive the car, you pay for you know, the wear and tear, for the oil, for the gasoline. That's the energy market. So in, in the power sector, we largely use the capacity market to drive our investment decisions. And then the energy market sort of happens in real time. It's less predictable. It's highly variable. And it contributes a little bit to our overall finances. But often the investment decisions are made in that forward capacity market time frame, which is three years forward, typically. And one of the interesting things about a carbon price is it's affecting the energy market after the investment decisions have already been made. It's a very, this is sort of a slightly more uh, abstract question. But so what I'm really proposing here is that we bring some of those price signals that are being sent in the energy market forward into the time frame where we're actually making the capital investment decisions. Because that's where they need to be. I don't know if that answers your question. It's a very good question, and what I probably should have clarified. So, OK, great, thank you. So I think that's it, actually. Oh, right, mad scientists and economy, uh, econo e economists wanted. I mean, this is the topic right now. I don't care whether you're interested in the environment, energy, the intersection, life on this planet. Uh, this is the goal right now. This is what we all need to be focused on. And so I, I think you, know, you all in this room are really the people who need to solve this problem. Uh, so I watch your papers on Monday with a complete solution to all of our market problems. All right, great. I think that's all I got. And I really do encourage every single one of you, if you have questions, if you want to talk about this, if you want to tell me how horribly wrong I am, uh, which is a distinct possibility, feel free to get in touch. I'm local. I live right down the street. Happy to chat. And if you want to, if you come by Rojo's in the morning on most Saturdays, I'll be there too. So, all right. Thank you all very much. I'm more than happy to take questions. Yeah, please. That's a great question. Honestly, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mix because you have state regulators who are very loath to give up control. You know, the, we have this strange dichotomy in the United States where a lot of energy policy is set on a state by state level and some of it's set at the federal level. During the early 2000s, the fashionable thing to do was to restructure your state, bring in competitive markets, and cede a lot of your jurisdiction over which power plants get built to the federal government. And it was this very, it was really the high watermark of federal state relations for the states that did that. And that's mostly the East Coast, the West Coast, and Texas, with large parts of the center of the country not doing that. Fast forward another decade, those areas have seen lower prices and have been treated very, very well, but they've given up their authority to drive power plant you know, which power plants get built in a lot of cases. And now, with the climate crisis, they're trying to seize some of that authority back. A lot of what I work on is actually not trying to stop that, because I, I think they're probably on the right path, but to harmonize the federal system with sort of the state system. We have a phrase we call the three A's, uh, accommodate, achieve, and uh, accommodate, adapt, and achieve. So the first thing we need to do is redesign our markets at the federal level to accommodate the state public policy goals. The second is to adapt on a more, uh, more sustainable basis going forward. 
our energy market structures and our capacity market structures so that they two work together. And then the last, this is the one I'm really excited about, is achieve. How can we use the federal wholesale markets, which are incredibly efficient, have these massive economies of scale to achieve the state's goals? And so that's what these last two ideas are. These are achieve, um, achieve kind of ideas where we will leverage the cost savings to bring in the investment into where the renewable should be. But the state regulators really hate it. We've seen an evolution over the last few years, though, among a lot of states. New England is probably the leader on this. California is just going whole hog. They don't, they, don't, they don't listen to anything we have to say. So they just go and throw money at it. That's fine. New England is actually interested in talking about these things. And it used to be that they really wanted a carbon price. And then I think over the last couple of years, they've done more modeling. They've come to understand it better. And they see a carbon price as largely benefiting natural gas units and doing relatively little to incent new renewables. So they've kind of moved off of that. One of the major things we talk about is there's two different things you can, two different market designs that you can have that care about carbon. Plenty of others that don't. One is reduce the overall carbon emissions on the grid. Carbon pricing is incredibly efficient. The other goal, which is sort of a parallel goal, is to maximize the amount of zero carbon energy, energy that's produced. And strangely enough, those are two very different goals and require very different strategies. Because if you care about just reducing total carbon, you don't care whether it's going from one gas-fired power plant to another or from, uh, you know, so just, you're just sort of trading off among various fossil fuel power plants. Yes, you do get the lowest carbon emissions at that time. The other is to bring on and finance more, get more of your energy mix from zero carbon resources. They cost more per increment, but you're actually preparing yourself better for the long-term carbon gain. So, you know, really as policymakers, there, there's not a clear articulation of which of those paths they want. And New England, I think they have realized that they need, that the sensible thing to do is go towards that second one maximizing zero carbon generation, but the political realities are that they want to be able to pick and choose which projects actually get built with very little regard to economics or overall carbon. That's the, you know, that's the great challenge. So we just need to convince you know, 10, 10 governors and state regulators and legislatures that this is a better idea than what they're doing now. It's hard. It's a hard thing to do. Come on, there's got to be other questions. Uh, full disclosure, I actually think we should pay the existing units to keep running, so just uh, revealing my preference. Um, you had two slides that sort of, I found internally contradictory, but maybe you can explain why. The first one accorded with the work that I've seen, which is that essentially implicitly we're paying something, sometimes hundreds of dollars, to avoid a ton of CO2 by using renewables. But then you had a later slide that showed that it was more cost effective. Yeah to go for the renewables, yet we have found that we can basically pay the nuclear guys less than $40 a ton and you can keep them up. So I'm trying to figure out what the contradiction is, because my <coughs> stuff I see is that's actually cheaper to keep the nukes going. So well, so, so I think you need to, it, it's, it largely comes into this what, what level of backsliding is, is, is uh, acceptable. So if you look at the cost of the nukes, we know exactly how much they're, they're getting. They're getting between 1650 in Illinois, uh, 1750 in New York. I actually don't remember what the New Jersey number is. It's kind of varied. So we have a very clear bogey of what that number is. The renewables costs are so locationally dependent and so variable with time. So you know, if you look at sort of historical data, which is what that one green, what the one sort of horizontal green bars are, that's taking into account a lot of older renewables projects that are relatively expensive compared to where they are today. Whereas the, you know, the Excel RFP data is something that just happened a few months ago and looks extremely competitive. For our slides comparing the nuclear cost to new renewables, uh, we used a, a mix of Lazard and IHS uh, new entry data. Um, I, in fact, I have another presentation where I have all the math broken out, but I didn't do that for this. Happy to provide that. But I think if you look at it and you say, we have $3 billion to spend, or whatever the number is, 7.5 in New York, and you look at the cost of building new renewables in New York, uh, you basically get to your 50% renewable target much, much faster. You beat it by about five years from 2030 to 2025 if you take the money that you were going to spend on the nukes and put it into renewables. 
And in fact, we, we, you know, pretty, I think the math is actually relatively simple. For the total amount of money that New York is planning on spending on the nukes, you could build twice as much on a per megawatt hour basis renewables for half the price. But it takes time, and that's the thing, that's, that's the, that's the, that's I think where a lot of the policy disagreement comes in, is are you willing to take the time it takes to build the renewables? Because, you know, building, uh, terawatt hours of new renewables, it, it, it just, it's, not, it's not an easy thing to do. It can't be done overnight. And so I think the question is, do you go accept that there will be some backsliding and take the money you were going to put into the nukes and put them into the new renewables? Or do you say, no, the backsliding, we want to keep the nukes online? Or do you try to do both? <laughs> and, you know, listen, California, New York, they are trying to do both. And if it works, if there's not ratepayer concerns, if we don't have ratepayer revolt, then you know it's entirely possible that, that that actually is the right strategy. But if you sort of assume, and this is sort of where you know my my sort of bias, that we have a limited amount of capital to deploy, that people will not accept massive rate hikes, then you probably are sacrificing. You are sacrificing investment in new renewables for the amount of money you're putting into the nukes. And that's the question: Is it worthwhile or not? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. So my dad was an environmental attorney, worked on the Clean Air, Clean Water Act in particular. And, you know, it was gospel in my house growing up that if you raised the price of something, people would use less of it, and that was a great way to conserve. That has kind of fallen out of favor in the energy industry. It's kind of, we're going to build our way out of that. You don't have to stop consuming electricity. We're just going to make it greener. It's a very much a supply side focus, which I don't, I don't really think is warranted in the energy industry. Energy efficiency, I mean, you saw on the green chart, it is incredibly cost effective. Now, there, there, there is some, some debate, I think, in the, in the industry as to whether it's quite as cost effective as a lot of studies have shown when you actually sort of look at it. But I could tell you some stories about energy efficiency think practices that are a little, eh. But for the most part, energy efficiency is incredibly good. And we are getting to the point, I have, you know, sense, which I don't know if anybody's familiar with, it's a box, it's a magic box that hooks up to your, uh, to your electric panel and gives you second by second tracking of your energy usage. You can look in and when you turn something on, you can actually look and go see it in real time. And I have to tell you, I now go around my house looking for things to turn off. And there's a lot of it, right? That kind of, that is definitely part of the four product future. As we, you know, the internet of things, I sort of hate that term. But it's true, the, supply, the demand side has to be part of the equation. Demand response, incredibly good investment, right? If there's an incredibly hot day, prices are screaming, we're turning on the dirtiest power plants, do you really want to have your steel mill running during that time? That's stupid. It's bad for everyone. And yet, you know, because we're relatively pricing, uh, excuse me, using economic terms, I never remember which one's which, but, you know, but that's a really dumb thing to do. And we should be driving demand response and by sending them the appropriate price signal. Just quick story, ERCOT, Texas, you know, deregulate it as much as you possibly can. They have an energy only market. Prices can go up to $9,000 in ERCOT per megawatt hour, which is what, $90 a kilowatt? It's incredibly, it's a, it's a huge amount of money. Far more, $9, right? Uh, far more than we would ever pay here for, for electricity. But they have that system, and it's incredibly punitive, but it also sends a very clear price signal that when prices go way, way up in ERCOT, you as a business or a consumer have a large financial interest in reducing consumption. This is the first summer where we're really going to see this in full effect. We've already seen bits and pieces, and we see, you know, for anybody interested, four coincident peak, transmission cost allocation in ERCOT, fascinating topic. Uh, that's how you allocate the cost of the transmission system based on your four, the four hours of your highest usage. That already drives some demand response in Texas. But for the most part, most of the demand response we see is from the capacity markets and the eastern markets. And then the energy efficiency expenditures are very interesting, and one of the things I find fascinating Energy efficiency, 
the combination of energy efficiency programs, low income customer programs, and the inability to serve them via a market-based mechanism. Really interesting topic. If anyone wants to start a business to do that, let me know. I'm happy to talk with you about it. But that, to me, is kind of a really fascinating uh, uh, mix. So I think we have time for one more question. And then there's. So uh, you mentioned uh, the innovation that happened in the telecommunications uh, field that was largely enabled by the uh, Telecommunications Act of 1995, I think it was. A lot of it was, a lot of deregulation was actually driven by a court case, which I find inspiring as a lawyer, but yeah, but yeah. <laughs> The Federal Power Act needs to be rewritten given its origins are in the uh, maintaining navigability uh, and hydro relationship. The Federal Power Act of 1935. Uh, yes, we have we have an entire like you know huge portion of our economy that is driven by a New Deal era congressional uh, statute that really hasn't changed very much in 75 years, whatever whatever number that is now. Uh, so yeah, it's hugely out of date in some ways. But the really interesting thing is the statute, you know, we, we get rid of all the nuance. It says that rates charged by utilities and therefore by generators and consumers have to be just and reasonable and not unduly discriminatory or preferential. That is really, you could, that is a, that is a very malleable piece of clay. So in that regard, the statute was kind of designed to be timeless. And I think our view of what's just and reasonable probably needs to evolve. If, like the greatest sin that the FERC under the Obama administration committed was not simply asserting, as you know, we think carbon is an existential threat. No rate charged by any utility that does not include a carbon externality is just and reasonable. Therefore, we're 206ing the entire utility sector. They could have done that. They had three votes but they were scared, they weren't sure it was legal, and they were timid about it. And I think they were completely convinced that Hillary Clinton was gonna win, and we'd be able to get the statute changed or somehow move forward. Huge mistake. You know, Gina McCarthy of EPA took a very different view. She said, damn the torpedoes, we're gonna pass something, and if the courts overturn it in five years, it'll be too late, because it'll already have been implemented. And FERC, because it's sort of a, you know, a, a, a more, um, conservative body didn't do that? It's a very open question in the legal community as to whether they have the authority to do it, and it would certainly have to be probably go to the Supreme Court, but hey, bring it on. <laughs> on that note, thank you so much for that really interesting talk. Thank you.